it's said that if you're not crashing, you're not trying hard enough. And that is certainly true when learning quadcopters, as I still am. Here are two receivers which have suffered at my hands. This one, the little XM Plus, I actually managed to whack on the corner there and broke the entire antenna off. That's not really an, an easy repair to do, but there are replacement antennas. It will be simply a case of removing this protective goo and replacing that. So we'll take a look at that. The other receiver then, an XSR. At first glance, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong. But if you look carefully at the end of this antenna, it's went into one of the propellers and is actually broken at the end. Let's take a closer look at that. Under the microscope, then, you can more clearly see the break in the antenna at the end there. What we'll need to do will be to cut back the outer sleeving to the same amount to restore the antenna to its proper length. To repair this antenna then the first thing we need to do will be to cut off the broken part like so and now we will have to make it the correct length. Now a little aside, what is the correct length? If you do the, the math you will discover that a quarter wavelength at 2.4 gigahertz is around 31 millimeters. If we measure this antenna it comes in at 25. If we measure the other FR Sky antenna it comes in at 22. Now, which is correct? Well what is correct is whatever is attached to your particular receiver. Each receiver has other components on the board for tuning and other purposes which will affect the length of the active part of the antenna, that is the unshielded portion at the end there. If we look at another example, well, this is a flight controller receiver out of a Volantex model and we can see the antenna clearly on there and that comes in at 26 millimeters. So don't be surprised if your antenna is a different length. Uh, this repair video really applies to any form of antenna. Just make sure that it is the same as it was before. When it comes to removing the shielded portion of the cable, there are a couple of ways that you can do it. If you have a nice sharp pair of side cutters, you can simply pull the outer off there. You can see the inner coaxial part. Then what you can do is to gently bunch that up and get it to move down over the sleeving, leaving that part exposed. Then either with side cutters or with a sharp knife, you can go around and remove that part. Make sure you remove those whiskery pieces. Look at that for example. You can see this piece here just for example. You wouldn't want that getting inside a, another receiver or anywhere else. And there we have the exposed portion. An alternative is with a sharp knife, get yourself a, a new blade, is to just to gently cut through and you can feel once it's gone through the plastic and starts to grate on that coaxial part inside and just turn the cable around. Once you can see that it's cut through, you can pull that off and then it's the same process as before. Just bunch that material up there. In this case I'm going to use my side cutters just to clip that off and there we have it. Another tip is not to try and cut the outer down to the exact value straight away. In this case I'm going to need 25 millimeters but rather than just try and cut that small piece off there if I go to say 30 millimeters and cut it down to there, 
once I've removed that, then I can do the final trim on the active piece there. Let's go ahead and do that. I've now stripped that down and it's a little over. I can now use my side cutters to trim that to the exact length. And there's the finished result. Now I can hear the purists already screaming, ah, but now the outer shield is not the same length as it was originally, and this has to be a multiple of the quarter wave length, yada, yada, yada. In reality, I don't believe it makes any difference. You may be able to measure something in the lab, but I'm not often flying in the lab, so this will work for me. With the other receiver then, as I said, it's not really practical to try and reattach that to the tiny IPX connector that's on there. I've bought a replacement antenna and I'll leave a link down in the description as where, where you can obtain those. Now you can see this yellowy goo which is supposed to keep the antennas in place. It may have been better if it had extended further out and then perhaps Mine wouldn't have broken off. Let's see if we can remove this IPX connector without causing further damage. And yes, just twisting it off there has revealed the tiny connector. I think again with my scalpel very gently. Oops. <laughs> well, there you go. Both of the connections are exposed now. Let's see if we can remove this material. It's quite brittle actually. There's enough of it removed now. Let's pop that little guy back on. Being blessed with fingernails, it's just a, a process of making sure that it's lined up and then giving it a push down onto the connection there. Although it will move, it is actually latched in, into place. That's another reason for having this coating applied. Now we can attach the new antenna here. That's clicked into place and that's a little bit more solid than the original one. Just confirming there that the two antennas are the same length. Of course, what also is needed is to recoat this. Now, I wouldn't suggest using an epoxy because at some time in the future I might want to replace that again. What I tend to use in these types of cases and for waterproofing equipment is this Plasti Dip. Now, this is obviously obtained locally here in Spain, but it's available pretty much globally, I believe. Just using a toothpick then, get a gob of the stuff. Put it over the components. Make sure it's over the connectors there, but not touching the little bind button. And I'm gonna goop that out. Over the wires there to give them a little more support. This dries to a rubbery consistency and in the future that could just be pulled off in a similar fashion to how I removed the original. Now I can leave that to dry and the job is done.